ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحلى العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي يا ربي أمين so I was actually thinking what should I do for you and then this came to my mind this was actually a project we did in my school and um, it's a big subject it's sad to know how many sunnas not only we don't know about subhanallah I mean when I was doing this I was like subhanallah Allah forgive me how many sunnas we don't know about and even the one we know about how many times we do it and how many times or how often we know how important this sunnah and we just choose to do some and not do the other and there is no difference between this and this this is what i was trying to make the point is is like you cannot pick and choose whichever you want other than the obligations but there's a lot of confirmed sunnah mu'akkada. we do it some of it but the rest we don't know we don't do it or we don't even know it's a confirmed sunnah so this is really sad so alhamdulillah rabbil alameen and when i was Looking at how would I do this, there's so many. So I chose to do it by one function or one thing so we can focus. So this may be at least two or three more classes. So I chose to start with what? Of course, with salah. Because that's the origin. And I'm not going to take you through inside salah because probably we'll not have enough time. But before, as we are coming to salah, and then when the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us that someone is going to call for salah and then inside salah but I don't know how much time we will have for that if not we will continue next week inshallah before I start this I'm going to start with the basics what is sunnah this was the title so what is sunnah okay what how do you define it I say that again so the way of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, that's fine, absolutely. There's two, th two ways you define it. You define it as the word itself, and what does it mean in Islam? And there's two things in Islam, when I'm talking about it in fiqh, and when I'm talking about it in general. So let's start, they, they call it lughata, meaning what does the word sunnah mean in Arabic? If you are, let's assume you're not a Muslim, and you're studying Arabic, and then the word sunnah came in. What does this word mean? You're not studying Islam. It's actually the path. Sunnah is a path. It's a tariq. It's a path. Yeah, literally. So if you want to say the way from here to the musalla, say, ma hiya sunnah ila al-musalla. But because our ears are so used to that word meaning this, so we find it very, uh, very strange. A sunnah al tariq literally. It's a tariq or al maslak or al manhaj That's how they define it. It's the path or it is the way and some says it's actually the followed way. Very few people will tell you it's a followed way. It's a path that I follow. So that's in general. In Islam, what does Sunnah mean? But you said it in Arabic. In general, it's anything he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, or he did, or yes, qarraraha, stayed silent. Someone did something in front of him or said something in front of him and he did not reject it or opposed it. So it's called the Sunnah Taqririya, meaning the fact he stayed silent, that means this is something he was okay with. Otherwise, he would not have stayed quiet about it. So something he did, something he said, something he approved, some people will say approved, and even in general, it's the way he looked and his character. Some will include all this under the sunnah. Said, did, approved, the way he looked, and the way he acted. And those of you who were with us in the six, 12 weeks we did about the sunnah, we learned a lot about his way and how he looked, alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is number one we need to learn. Number two, why do you need to study the sunnah? Number one. Number one. And Allah said in, in the Quran, before I say the ayah, do you love Rasul Yeah, why, why you are asking? Of course I do. Then I'm going to say, show me. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ali Imran. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهَ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ اللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ If you really love Allah, and of course we do, follow me. 
me okay. is a rasu alayhi salatu wasalam following a rasu alayhi salatu wasalam the path the sunnah what is the result number one allah will love us that's what this what the verse is saying you for sure you say you love allah then follow me allah will love you and will forgive your sins what does it what will i get other than the love of allah if i do the sunnah because we need all of us to move our casual way of looking at sunnah it's just a sunnah it's very common and i'm not talking about you to young who when you muslims who i'm talking about some people even who alhamdulillah allah taught them we look at it as just sunnah so if i don't do it what will happen now fiqh this is the definition of it or the other name for it is something recommended mustahab so what will i get if i do it so now we're gonna go for Aisha, inshallah or you just prayed maghrib and you did two ruka'at after maghrib almost everybody does alhamdulillah what did i get so what did i get if i do it and what about it just a sunnah i'm not gonna do it you'll get the blessing and the pleasure of allah even more definitely but there is more credit what is the credit why you're scared you will be rewarded yeah it's simple you will be rewarded if you do it one times ten if i don't do it nothing will happen that's why people unfortunately will start really in general in general in al fiqh when you say something is sunnah or mustahab or recommended if you do it you will be rewarded if you don't do it you will not be punished in general fiqh in the in the like uh, um, um, like in the law of Islam, that's how it is. But this is how I look at it in dunya, right? Somebody will say, you know what? If you stay two more minutes in this place, I'll give you $5. If you leave, nothing is going to happen. How many people will stay? It's $5 only. I didn't say it. Everybody will stay, right? If, and if you, if you leave on time, nothing will happen. No punishment. So here you are, one times 10, and it can be even more. So that's, I need this, I started with this as basics. Some of you probably, all of you know it, but it's always good to start with the basics. Number two, did he predicted that some time is gonna come where people will start forgetting his sunnah? In, not in general, but Islam Islam starts as a stranger and will end up as a stranger. But this is specifically about someone who learned the abandoned or forgotten Sunnah and he or she revived them. Did he say anything about it? And listen to this hadith. This hadith will make you smile that Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy a good number showed up today. That tells you, you really want to learn. So let's say what he said. Rasul said the following. And it's in a tirmidhi. Man ahya sunnah min sunnati qad umitat ba'di fa inna lahu min al-ajri mitlu man amila biha min ghayri an yonqus min ujurihim shay'a wa man ibtada'a bid'atan dalalatan la yardaha Allah wa rasooluh kana alayhi mitlu athami man amila biha la yonqus thalika min awzarihim shay'a This is in a tirmidhi. Let's translate. And I want you to pay attention to the words because in the words you can tell he, he predicted that the sunnah will die. Subhanallah. And he said the following. And he said, this is to Bilal, Sayyidina Bilal. And he said, I am, uh, no, he said to Bilal, no, learn. And Sayyidina Bilal says, I'm ready to learn, teach me. And he said it again, learn, no, i'lam. And he said, I'm ready to learn. Now comes in. He said, Indeed, whoever revive a sunnah that from my sunnah that has died after me. Sunnah died after him, alayhi salatu wasalam. That person comes in, he or she, young or old, revive it. So what will happen? He says, that person who will revive it, then for him or her, the reward similar the reward similar to everyone who did it before and everyone who's going to do it. Revive a sunnah, a dead sunnah. But he specifically says, Matat ba'di, died after me. 
And before I will tell you a couple of the ones I'll discuss, I'm going to ask you. And he said the opposite also, so be careful. And he said, and whomsoever act upon, uh, uh, whomsoever re revived or, or invented innovation, a bid'ah, he will have the punishment of everyone that did it without minimizing the punishment of the other. So be very careful, and I always say this, especially these days with all the internet and availability and people start spreading hadith. This is the hadith. And then most of people, honestly, how much knowledge we have about the hadith. And we love Rasulullah Alhamdulillah, I learned it. You need to be very careful. Did he really say it? Is that really the hadith, that, that his words? And is this really the action? So whomsoever revived a dead sunnah, that's our topic, abandoned sunnah. So now let's talk. Give me a couple of sunnahs, something related to the salah that is a completely abandoned. Think of the masjid. Think when you come upstairs or at your home that we abandoned it. We know it, but we abandoned it. Before salah, I'm giving you a clue. Not about wudu. Again, before salah, something we're going to salah, and he did it almost, almost every time. And rarely you find people. Okay, I'll give it to you, because you probably are going to keep <laughs> guessing. Number one, number one is a siwak. And I'll, I'm going to come to it in detail. Siwak, right? One. Number two. And this, you see it in the masjid every time, even in Juma. What do we do when the adhan is being called? Women, especially upstairs. And what is the sunnah here? He didn't say quiet. He said, he said, listen, number one. That's why you're quiet, because you can't talk and listen. So he said, listen, I'll come to it in detail. So that's number two. Okay, number three. So the adhan went in, right? But not yet the salah. What is the sunnah here? Dua. What do we normally do? Talk. Talk. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Number four, which is, this is also very common, but very rarely you see it. You're not in the masjid. You are outside in the park. A salah time comes in. Pray with or without the shoes. It's not you can do it. It's a sunnah with the shoes uh -huh, I love the ha huh? see it's a dead sunnah alhamdulillah I'm so happy because that made me feel even happier because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me say it absolutely and I'll come to it I'm just giving you now the like outline I'll come with every hadith and what he said praying not on the earth not on the ground so in the car in the plane is it sunnah or not? Especially in the car. In the plane, there is issues about it. Praying in the car. Is sunnah or not? I'm not talking about obligatory salah. I didn't say driving. I said in the car. Yes or no or I don't know. You are in the car. It's a sunnah. As salatu ala rahila, they say it. This is what he did. I'll come to it. Don't jump. Patient. Isbiru. At least I'm getting your attention. So alhamdulillah. That's very good. But can we have a little bit quieter attention? So as salatu ala rahila. He actually prayed on the camel. On the camel. And there's a hadith about that. So I can pray. I should. This is how I want you to all think of it. Every now and then, I want to do one of the things that we are learning for only one reason. It's a sunnah and I'm reviving it. And it would be lovely if someone asked you, so why you are doing this? And you're going to say, it's the sunnah. Then you revived it, the hadith I shared with you. So number one, siwak. And I didn't expect that many people in this room because I brought some siwak with me. So I'm not going to give it to anybody because who I'm going to give it to, right? Honestly, I didn't expect that. Alhamdulillah. So siwak, pray in your shoes. Listen to the adhan. Between adhan and iqama, you usually make a dua and there's also a sunnah in between this. One more. And the sunnah al-nawafil, al-rawatib. So let's start one by one. 
why should I listen to the Adhan? I'm very busy. I'm very busy. I'm, alhamdulillah, I'm standing up in the masjid to pray. Yani, I need this five minutes to answer all my text messages. Check on my children. Yeah, my friend, she just posted something. Just two seconds, let me check it. Why do I have to listen? So look at this. Our Rasul والسلام, said, and I'm going to share with you the hadith because it's very explicit. There is not a different opinion. إِذَا سَمِعْتُمُ النِّدَاءَ فَقُولُوا كَمَا يَقُولُ الْمُؤَذِّنِ When you hear a nida, a nida is the call for salah. Adhan, we call it, and the other name for it is a nida. When you hear it, when you hear it, fa, fa means immediately. Qulu, say it what kind? Is it optional or it's an order? It's order. Faqulu, say the same what the mu'adhin, the person who's calling for salah, is saying. And this is in Al Bukhari and Al Muslim. Say, listen and say. I don't know what he is saying. My niya is I want to say what he is saying, and I'm, since I'm seeing some, some maybe don't know the Arabic language, just listen. And your niya is to listen, and inshallah Allah will teach you. As the more you hear it, you will know how. So that's number one. Number two, once you finish what he said, what do you do? We start talking. We start talking with the person next to us. So now I learned, right? <laughs> you are all laughing because it's true, right? Subhanallah, it's painful, but it's true. But Alhamdulillah, Allah is teaching us. So what should I say? He's, Mu'addin is done, finished. He called for the Adhan. Adhan is called for the prayer. So he finished. What should I do? So I say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Just a second, just a second. One question first. I say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Yes or no, or I don't know? Okay, let me teach you, because it is not. <laughs> So our Rasulullah said the following. That's another hadith. He said, this is in Muslim. إِذَا سَمِعْتُمُ الْمُؤَذِّنِ You hear the adhan. Number one. فَقُولُوا مِثْلَ مَا يَقُولُ Say the same way what he is saying. Except when he say, حَيَّ عَلَى الصَّلَاةِ حَيَّ عَلَى الْفَلَاحِ What do you say? لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ No power, no change of status, but by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now he finished. This is what I need to do. فَقُولُوا مثل ما يقول المؤذن ثم then صلوا علي who doesn't know اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد so ثم صلوا علي صلى الله بها عليكم عشرة you say one الله will respond by ten see how much we are losing say you say once الله say ten ثم سلوا للوسيلة then make a dua for the Rasul alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma rabba hadhi al-da'wa al-tama wa salat al-qa'ima ati Muhammadan al-wasila. What's al-wasila? What's al-wasila? No, al-maqam al-mahmud is different. What is al-wasila? It's, it's exactly, it's actually an, a highest level. And it's like eminence, like somebody will become royal in, in dunya. So ask Allah, here I am, me, Rasul asking me to make for him. And I am so miser, I don't even do it. Because there is a reason after I do this, what will I get? So number one, you're going to send salah ala Rasul Number two, you're going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him a high status, al-wasila. So, masallallaha li al-wasila, fa'innaha manzila fil jannah. It's a status or it's a place in jannah. No one will get it. La tabghi li abdin min ibadillah wa arju an akuna ana huwa. This is very high level in jannah. Very difficult for ordinary people, for people to get there. And he is saying, I hope that I will be there. Rasul So he is asking you and me to make dua for him. فَمَنْ سَأَلَ لِيَ الْوَسِيدَ Now comes in. Whomsoever asked Allah to give me that status, حَلَّتْ عَلَيْهِ شَفَاعَتِي Allah. Then he deserved my intercession. And how much we need the intercession? Imagine, I want you honestly, when you think of the intercession of Rasulullah think of yourself in a big trouble. 
honestly, in a big trouble. And the only way that the, you will be out of this trouble, if someone comes in and put a good word for you, a big trouble, they will fire you. Think of it like you're in a, at work and they will fire you. And then you look and look and says, you know what, this person, I'm going to go and talk to him or her and I'm going to say, write an email on my behalf so they will not fire me, right? And that person wrote and you're not fired. How happy you are. How happy? Alhamdulillah. Now this is this life. How about there where no one neither speak nor write an email, nor intervene except him, alayhi salatu wasalam. And he didn't say only I'll do it. Hallat alayhi shafa'ati. You will get it. He will intercede for you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying only what? Listen to the adhan. Subhanallah. Listen to the adhan. Finish. Send salah to Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. And then make the dua. And I'm going to share with you the dua next. Make the dua. You get the shafa'a, intercession. Question comes in. Is the dua only the live dua? Only when I am in the masjid? Or can it be when I am home? Can it be on my phone? Can it be on the, on the uh, uh, television? Yes. When it is the time for salah. So on your phone, time for salah. Adhan goes in. You listen. Repeat. And then make the send salah to Rasul salam, and then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the dua five times a day. That's five shafa'a per day. Times how long we are living, how much we missed. SubhanAllah, may Allah remind us all. This is, I think, one of the problems is that we don't remember because we don't think it's a priority. We don't forget important things. All of us, we don't. But things that is not very important or it's second or third level, we forget. So, حلت عليه شفاعتي. Number two. So, this is the first one. When you listen to the adhan, listen and say salah ala rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. Praying in your shoes. Sometimes you need to do it for only one reason. Because it's a sunnah. And especially when you are outside. Because when you are outside, the other day when we're in MSA, right? Very few people did it. Very few people did it. It was not a musalla. It was not a place where it was, where there, the carpet is made for prayers. So you don't put your shoes on it because it will get dirty. But if you are outside anywhere, anywhere, keep your shoes. And this is the hadith of Rasulullah Wasallam. He said, yes, go ahead. Yeah. If you are outside the masjid or outside a musalla, you come in and there is no special carpet made that the whole room had the carpet. Otherwise, you, you don't need to take off your shoes. And I'm going to share with you two hadiths. So this one is actually, he was in his salah, alayhi salatu wasalam. In the middle of the salah, he took off the shoes. In the middle of the salah, he took off the shoes. So, of course, what do you think the people behind him did? The Sahaba took off their shoes. So he said, why did you take off your shoes? Look at this. In the middle of the Salah, they said, you took it off, we are taking it off. Path, followed, Sunnah. He then said, no, in the middle of Salah, Jibreel came to me and told me there is impurity on your shoes, take it off. And now comes the teaching. This is what he says. He says, إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ When someone comes to the masjid, let him check his shoes. If there is no impurity, let him pray with it. Not in this masjid. The masjid that time, was there was no carpet. So what did I say? Any place you are praying, there is no special carpet for that the whole room. Meaning, in your house, if you are in the house, you normally don't take off your shoes when you, are, when you enter the, the house. When you put your sajada, if you are standing outside the sajada, you pray with your shoes. Did you get the point? Pray with your shoes. So that's the first thing. He did it. Then he comes in with a hadith and he said, This is an order. 
pray with your shoes be different from the Jewish and the Christians. It's actually in, in um, I have it here. It's in uh, Abu Dawood. Abu Dawood. So pray with your shoes. So what do we need to do? I want to, number one, to remember the hadith, the first one I shared, is whoever revive a sunnah. Whoever revive a sunnah, he or she will have the reward of everyone who followed that sunnah. So imagine you are in Eid Salah and thousands, and you're standing there with your shoes. And of course, people will look at you. So, so immediately, now your intention is to revive the sunnah. Right? Not to be different. Not to show people you know. Because then that's not for Allah. Your niyyah is to revive the sunnah. You look at people and say, it's okay to pray with your uh, shoes. It's sunnah. And you can quote the hadith. Yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Absolutely in the airport. That's all the time. Airport. In, uh, uh, in the park. No, it's in the, in the place, in the airports, there is no special carpets. It's an interfaith room or it's a meditation room. Almost every airport uh, in the United States, I, at least I have traveled. Right, yeah, but in, in, in DC also, they have a special place, like a special place. It's all carpet. That one you take off your shoes. But if you come in, let's assume this is the interfaith room or meditation room. You come in here and then you only see the qibla and then they put the sajada on the chair, which is also very common. You pull the sajada, right, the prayer rug, you put it on the direction of the qibla, but you stand with your shoes. But you're not standing on the prayer rug. You're standing outside the prayer rug. And your intention, this is why I keep saying this, the intention is to revive the sunnah. And you follow the sunnah. And let it be no one else is doing it. You do it. You do it. You go to the haram. When you pray outside, this is all courtyard with your shoes. Doesn't matter. Actually, the hadith originally, Naal Naal is a slipper. It's not the shoes. What did they, what did they wear these days, those days? It's hot and it's desert. What did they wear? Exactly. Could it be anything? It's not the, the idea is, in the idea, it's okay. And that, the third thing is don't jump on people who pray in, your, in their uh, shoes. Because that's what we also do. It's like, don't do it. What is that? Take off your shoes. And that person tried to explain it's a sunnah. And then is like, no. Alhamdulillah, now you're learning. No, really. And Alhamdulillah. So that's number two. Sallu fi li'aq. Number three, pray in the car. Now, let, before you all jump on me, okay? Number one, not obligatory salah unless you have to. Meaning, if there is no time left, so, and this is especially at Maghrib, people coming from work, imagine you work in downtown, right? And there's a huge, uh, uh, let's say, traffic on Highway 40, major accident, and it's Maghrib. And you hit your car at 5. And by the time you get home at 6.30, you miss the Maghrib. So that's an obligatory. But you can do that. Because exceptions of the rules when you are in a state of need. Otherwise, the salah, will, the salah time will lapse. Otherwise, the, the obligatory salah is actually need to be outside the car. Whether moving or not moving. Whether you're the driver or you are, in, you are sitting in the car. Coming to the sunnah, you can do it as a sunnah, revive it. So duha, I had a lot of my teachers with them in the car, duha time, they are praying in the car. And I know why, I mean, duha still has time, but the idea is to revive it, to remind people, duhur salah, maghrib sunnah, I mean, the sunnahs I'm talking about. And this is where he says, uh, this is one is sahabi has, narrated this hadith. He said, the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam kana yusabbihu ala al-rahila ayya wajhin tawajja wa yuturu alayha ghayra innahu la yusadu al-maktuba. He said, the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam it's actually Abdullah ibn Umar. He said, the voluntary prayer 
الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام did it when he was riding on his camel and whatever direction it was going he was praying because it's moving same thing applied for the plane probably for the plane a lot of you know that but I'm talking about we are not traveler we are in here and then he said he did witter on, on the camel witter salah on the camel but he did not do obligatory except when we are in need are you okay? your face is says like what is she saying? I did it one time I had no option if I waited I, if I waited till I come I would have missed it yes you can I, I made a dua that you want it's a true story I made a dua that the traffic light become red and the, the, the traffic light become red and I did the quickest salah I've ever done I mean literally yeah I had to because my other option was I will miss it no way I'll make it home I, I could tell no way huh I couldn't because I was in the in the street I couldn't it was a, it was a, it was a highway to the street so my point is you find all the options you are all talking about can I park on the side can I be stop at somewhere and safe and I pray but I'm talking about none of this you can pray as a driver but if you are not a driver there's no issue about it the driver is because you're worried and about the safety and how can I focus but in general absolutely you can do right so what the, the idea is in the in the car just revive the sunnah in general you're not going to do every day the four the rakat before dhuhr in a, in the car but i will revive it i will try to do at least once a day so if i left the house and it's time for duha i was like okay i'm gonna do it in the car you see my point just revive it till it becomes a habit because this is what he said man ahya sunnati who whomsoever revive my sunnah another salah that very few of us does or even know about it's a sunnah it's called salatul tawbah salatul tawbah what is salatul tawbah so the, the the prayer of repentance so what is that anyone and i'll share with you the hadith anyone who commit a sin any sin don't think of major major big ones any sin somebody just backbite right looked at something haram said something not pleasing to allah immediately what is the sunnah exactly you go and do wudu and two rakat do wudu and two rakat and i'll share with you the hadith and this is in abi dawood sayyidna abu bakr narrated this hadith and abi bakr sadiqa sami'tu rasulullah alayhi salatu wa salam yaqul ma min abdin yuznibu dhanban fayuhsinu at tuhur not a single servant of allah commit a sin that tells you we all are liable subhanallah use me one sin perfect wudu then he stand up and perform two rukat then ask allah for forgiveness illa ghafar allah allah will forgive him Subhanallah, any sin, any sin, you do it, I do it, we do it, immediately. Get up, go to the bathroom, perform good wudu, then stand up in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do two rukat and ask Allah for forgiveness. Question comes in, what about if I don't remember it? Later on I remember it, can I do the salah later on? So I said something, for example, during the day, and I didn't pay attention. And then when I was going to bed, I remembered. Oh, I did that. I looked at that. Can I do it? Scholar says yes. It's preferably immediately. But even later on is. And then in that hadith, he recited the ayah in Surah Ali Imran. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُوا الذُّنُوبَ إِلَى اللَّهَ those who commit and Allah has used fahisha. Fahisha is actually marriage, yani, uh, intimate relation outside marriage. So that's zina. Aw zalamu anfusahum. They wrong do themselves. That's the other ones. Did something, said something, looked at something. 
Allah. Immediately you remember Allah. Astaghfiru li dhunubihim and ask for forgiveness. And then Allah says, who else will forgive but Allah? وَمَنْ يَغْفِرِ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَى اللَّهِ صَلَاةُ التَّوْبَةِ It can be done alone, and it can be also done together. It's, it's a sunnah. It's, they didn't say it's a confirmed sunnah, but it's a sunnah. I think each one of us, myself included, if not number one, at least once a day we need to do it. Sometimes more. Especially if we were invited somewhere. You know what I'm saying, right? Right, but I would not, yes, but I would not delay it. Because the more we delay it, the more shaitan will come to us and the more we will get lazy. So immediately, if you remember it, immediately stand up and do it. And ask Allah. So two ruka'ah, there is nothing special to read. You can read any part of the Quran, but ask Allah for forgiveness. And Allah will... I was just coming to it. Subhanallah. Any time the scholar said, even if it is after Asr, even if it is after Fajr. So let's assume this. Subhanallah, these are timings where Salah is not recommended in general, after Fajr and after Asr. So after Fajr, right, you just prayed and finished, and then checked your phone, and there was a message that really upsets you. And then you answered with anger, and you said something not pleasing to Allah. Immediately, go and pray. They say, because this salah has a reason. Any salah has a reason, you can do it in these times. So istikhara, uh, like you're asking Allah to guide you in a decision, or salah to tawbah, right? Or istisqa, or al mayyit or any salah that has a reason, the janaza salah, the salah for the rain, any of these, you can do it in these times, which is not recommended to pray. So salah to tawbah, yes, yes. Yes, salat al-shukr. It's not salah. It's, it's usually sajdat al-shukr. You prostrate, you prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to any, when immediately the good news comes in, immediately, naturally, you actually go for prostration. I mean, you've seen it sometimes, those of you who watch uh, football, not the football, soccer. And these days, especially, honestly, especially these days with all these, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, very famous celebrity players, and they are practicing Muslims. Immediately they go for sujood. In the middle of the uh, field, in the middle of the non-Muslims thousands. I mean, if you have watched Muhammad Salah player, you know, all the players, subhanallah. So yes, but not a specific salah. It's sajda. You just go for prostration. Now it comes to the siwak. Siwak. What is siwak? What's siwak or miswak? Yeah, you, that's okay. It's actually both are right. Miswak or siwak. What is it? Yeah, what is it? It's actually cleaning the mouth with a stick. Right? Subhanallah. And the stick is the arak tree. And you see it everywhere it is sold. So what, what's the big deal? Yani we have toothbrush and we're done. And I can floss and I'm done. Can, can can I finish? Can I finish? <laughs> can I finish? <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. It's okay. It's coming. It's okay. At least you are very interested. Alhamdulillah. That's good. So here you go. And I want you to memorize this. And not memorize. If you memorize, alhamdulillah, the meaning it will make you love to do siwak or miswak. Rasulullah sallam said, and this is in Ahmed and then Bukhari also. He said, as siwak, as siwak. That's the beauty. Siwak is a cleansing agent, or it's a cleanse for the mouth. Okay, I can toothbrush. I can uh, uh, floss. Second one is only with siwak. It's a pleasing to Allah. So when you are doing it, or I am doing it, or we are doing it, we are not only cleaning the mouth, we are actually in an act of worship. I will be rewarded for it. So everybody so keen on washing, on brushing the, the teeth, right? Your children are in big trouble if they do not brush their teeth before they go to bed, right? Because you have to take care of your teeth. Why not miswak? 
why not doing miswak? I have tried it for a month, for no, not a month, for two weeks, with not brushing my teeth. Just wanted to see, la ilaha illallah, and I know, and I know it, because when I floss, I know if my teeth needs more cleaning. It is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's cleansing to the mouth. Miswak. The other one also, Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, someone said this and I said, just be patient. If it was not hard for my ummah, see how merciful alayhi salatu wasalam was with us. Subhanallah. And he knows us. And he said, if it was not hard for my ummah, for my people, I would have ordered them to perform, to use miswak, do miswak with every salah. Imagine. Imagine this. So how can I do these both? What is the best thing to do? Put your miswak next in the bathroom, next to your toothbrush, and you will see it. And you can clean the... Coming, just bismillah. I'll, well, I am coming. I'm coming where it is recommended. And how do we solve it? Because we all not only learn, but we need to figure out practical ways of doing. Allahu Akbar. Oh, it's in the masjid. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله 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 الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل بارك على محمد وعلى آل كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل محمد ربنا دعوتا وصلاة قولنا بمحمد So when do I do siwak? What's the sunnah? Number one we said before salah Right? Number two I'll give it to you because I don't think any, anybody does that, at least these days. Every time you enter the house, when you are especially meeting your family, and this is all hadith of Rasulullah and just for the time, I'm going to quickly go. And he says, this is Sayyidina Anas. Anas was his helper, his servant. And he said, When he entered the house, Miswak was in his hand. And when he is in his hand, meaning he's using it. So when you enter the house, number three, first thing he does when he wake up for salah for the night salah, when he wakes up from the salah from the sleep for the salah, the first thing he does is he do miswak. So for us to practice this for the night, put it next to your nightstand. So the first thing when you come when you wake up, you just how long it takes. Less than a minute. When you get used to it, less than a minute. So that's number three. Number four, every time he ate something that changed or, or make or, or bring a smell to the mouth, he used to use the siwak. Every time he did it, alayhi salatu wasalam, whenever there is smell coming out, like garlic, like onion, then he used the siwak. Number five, when entering the masjid, Every time. Because they say this is the beauty of it. Entering the masjid, that we need to beautify ourselves when we enter a masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all do that. 
beautify it in the way pleasing to Allah. It's not beautify the way I like. So what we see, like, we, we need as the time we take for us to beautify ourselves going to a big gathering or a wedding, do we do the same thing when we are coming to the masjid? And inside the masjid too. It's fine. Yeah, because before the salah. Because it's before the salah. So here you go entering. So you, you stopped your car. Let's take reality. You stopped the car and you did siwak. Or you are walking, you entered the masjid, open the door. If you are if you are like Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, where you follow it by the letter, he used to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah by the letter. Even if the action is not needed at that time, he used to do it. So if you want to do it, you, you open the door and you do the miswak. Then you go upstairs before the salah and you do the miswak. And I'll tell you, I have seen people, women, the siwak is in her purse. In her purse. Well, and not only one, usually a couple. Allah knows how many times she gave me. Honestly, because what is she doing? She's reminding us. May Allah reward her. She was a hafidh. May Allah give her jannah for those. Every time. So when you enter the masjid, and when you read the Quran, and the Qiraat al Quran, when you read the Quran, you also use the siwak. Why? Why? Before reading the Quran. You, you, let's assume, let's assume I just brushed my teeth and I actually flossed. But I need to do this. Number one, Sunnah, pleasing to Allah, but because I am reading the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my mouth has to be the most purified and in a pleasing state to Allah. And he likes the siwak. SubhanAllah. The last thing, والسلام, if you all know, when he died, right, the last thing Sayyidah Aisha gave him, exactly, was a miswak. He looked at it and he was too weak to grab it. So she understood right away. She took it, put it in her mouth and gave it to him. She used always to say, my, my saliva was the last thing he tasted. SubhanAllah. Yeah, SubhanAllah. Yani, this is something very easy. You, these days you find it anywhere. You go on Amazon and you can order Allah knows how many kinds. And the masjid, everywhere you go now, there is siwak. It's very, uh, very common. Last thing before the salah, because also related to salah, is a sutra. Sutra is the, like a barrier. When you are praying. So when you, that's when you are praying alone. If you are praying with the imam, the imam is your sutra. So what is the sutra? Because a lot of people misunderstand this. Sutra is where I am praying and where I am going to, prostrate where my sajda that space is needs no one comes in it and so i need to put my sutra my barrier in there so if i am walking in the masjid and i have put let's assume anything i put it that i understood this is the barrier i can walk from here but i cannot walk from here he alayhi salatu wasalam, especially when he traveled he always had a piece of wood and the Sahaba said he had always carried with him a piece of wood. When he stand up for salah, he put it in front of him. Because he was the imam. For us here, you see, why do you see the mihrab where the imam stands? Right? It's always a wall in front of him. So a wall is a sitra. So at home when you are praying, usually pray to a wall. The wall is a sitra. Nobody is going to come. If you are upstairs to the pillars or to the wall, and why is that? Again, because it is a sunnah. Our Rasulullah said, إِذَا صَلَّى أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيُصَلِّي إِلَى سُتْرَ وَالْيَدْنُ مِنْهَا وَلَا يَدَعَ أَحَدْ يَمُرُّ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ If anyone of you is praying, let them pray to a sutra. Sutra means a barrier. Anything can be a barrier. Anything. Purse, paper, um, anything. You will say the phone, I'll say the phone, but don't put it up. Because it will be a distraction, right? And subhanAllah, how many times you say Allahu Akbar on the salah and the phone starts. So turn it up. And your niyyah is to use it as a sutra, but turn it. So you won't, don't get distracted. So the hadith says, Who am, so ever stand up for salah, let him stand up. Yusalli ila sutra. Let him put or she put a barrier. And now this is the description of. Let him or her be so close to that barrier and don't you let anyone come between you. 
at all. This is what you do. And literally you fight them. You literally fight them. Because another hadith, he said the meaning of if the person who is passing in front of the person who is praying, meaning passing between him and the barrier, if he knows the punishment of this, he would have waited 40 years. 4-0. The only exception scholars allowed it is in Al-Haram. Only in the Haram when it is crowded. Not in the Haram in general, when it is crowded. Like when you get stuck in the tawaf and then it's salah time and you need to leave, there is no way you're going to move unless you pass through people. But in general, don't take it lightly. So what we learned today about the, it's all related to salah. And I try to give you the most forgotten one. There is, there is more, but less abandoned. But these are absolutely abandoned. Rarely anyone does it. Listen to the adhan. Say what the, what the imam says and make the dua afterward. Between adhan and iqama, make a dua. Pray with your shoes. You put a sutra. To pray in your car. Use your siwak as frequent as you can. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us and give us the ability not only to learn, but also to practice. Jazakumullahu khayran. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ulaik. Sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. Tasliman kathira. Wa iyaakum. May Allah reward you all for coming. Yes, no, we're going to walk. <laughs>